Bring Welsh Knowledge Share series. Uh, the aim of these monthly events is to bring together members of the Turing and the Roche networks and the wider scientific community to hear different perspectives on topics in data science and build new connections. As the partnership research progresses, we'll also be regularly showcasing this at future events as well. Um, so just to get us started, I'm just going to share uh, a couple of slides. Um, Hopefully uh, you can all see that. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Turing Rush Partnership, uh, the clue is in the name. Uh, so a partnership between the Alan Turing Institute and Roche. Hopefully uh, most of you will be familiar with at least one of these, um, but just in case not, I've uh, included some information. So the Turing Institute was established in 2015 as the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Uh, we have a network of universities, uh, research in a huge range of disciplines, um, but the partnership sits under our, our Health and Medical Sciences programme. And Roche uh, established uh, a little bit uh, further in the past uh, than Turing. Um, it's a leading healthcare company um, with a growing advanced analytics network, um, and they've established a number of academic partnerships. And we started our strategic five-year partnership together in June 2021. Um, and this on the screen is our partnership North Star. Um, so this is what we're aiming towards at the end of our five years and beyond. Um, so ultimately, we're collaborating to explore this term patient and disease heterogeneity for advanced analytics. So uh, in more simpler terms, why patients respond differently to treatment and why diseases manifest in different ways in different people. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different research areas and activities we could explore in this area over the five years. And um, we've chosen two research themes so far that we're pursuing. Um, and you can find out more about our current activities on our partnership page, uh, which you can find on the Turing website. And what's not reflected in this kind of North Star is the connections and the collaborations we want to build. Um, so it's critical for us to be running events like this to get you all involved. So today's event theme is AI and health equity, um, a growing area of interest and lots of great initiatives have been set up to explore this. Um, we'll be hearing about the Turing Interest Group on this topic from Hong Hang. Um, and also linked into that interest group is the Data Science for Health Equity community um, who have been doing some great work as well. I'll actually pop a link in the chat about them as well. Um, and this topic is of particular importance to the Turing Rush Partnership. Um, we want any tools or algorithms we develop um, to ensure we improve healthcare for everyone and don't exacerbate any existing inequalities. So I'm delighted to welcome our three speakers today who will be giving us insights into how AI can play a role in ensuring health equity. So we're joined by Hong Hang Wu, an associate professor at the Institute of Health Informatics at UCL um, and a Turing Fellow. Fanny C, Head of AI and Emerging Technology External Collaborations, and Joshua Huang, an AI and Digital Healthcare Partner, and they are both from Roche. As we mentioned, we'll be hearing from our speakers and then we'll have a dedicated Q&A session. We should have plenty of time for questions. Um, you can ask specific questions uh, to individual speakers or you can ask a question for both of them to answer. Um, and with that, I'll stop sharing, hand over to Hong Hang. Um, are you ready to share your screen? Thanks, Ricky. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, this one. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that looks good. Full screen. Okay, cool. All right. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to uh, have the opportunity to um, share with you some of our thought, thoughts about fairness in AI. So my name is Hong Hao Wu, as Ricky introduced, I'm uh, based at UCL, my background is computer science. So um, I work closely with uh, NHS um, colleagues on different um, disease areas, particularly using AI. So one of these um, area we have particularly interested in recently is the fairness in AI or in data embedded um, um, in quality or, or AI in, uh, induced in quality. So today's talk, basically I want to discuss with you um, some of our thoughts about um, fairness in AI enabled clinical decision making and why isn't it being evaluated so far? 
So when I say why isn't it being validated, it's not, and um, it's not, and uh, people not studying this area. It's more like for those people applying AI and evaluate their model performance and publish in the, um, you know, a preprint or in uh, any um, journal publications, conference publications. They usually don't, at least at this moment, they usually don't report their fairness in in, in their final um, results and result section. Just not, at least not as um, as uh, frequent as people evaluate accuracy, F1, precision recall, that kind of stuff so far. So the reason behind this, and many reasons, but one, one of the reasons we thought could be uh, reside in the fairness uh, definition itself or framework to evaluate fairness itself. So I have about 15 minutes. So I'm trying to, I have about 25 slides. So I might have to uh, skip some of the slide, but um, let, let me start with the you know, uh, motivation slide, uh, which is uh, the slide uh, displayed now. So we know in, in quality or in, in um, unfair in healthcare is a long-standing issue and uh, it's potentially very damaging for, for healthcare and particularly for AI, uh, which is going to be high, applied in, in healthcare for facilitating uh, the health services. So the, uh, the left-hand side is one recent work we uh, published one of the, uh, it's a bill, uh, it's the um, PhD student based at UCL. She has done a great job in terms of analyzing a very popular data set about liver disease, which is used a lot, like in our teaching in AI model development for at least more than 15 years out there in the, in the open space. So she started the, um, the uh, um, you know, equality comparing female and male um, population in terms of AI model developed for predicting liver disease status. The outcome, there are you know, many results, the key result or the, the most um, eye-catching result, just put the sentence here, just false negative predictions for liver disease are twice in women compared to men, uh, in men, which means that uh, we are more likely to miss those patients um, which, who have liver disease in female than in, in male. So that's that's very. Uh, this paper actually uh, is published uh, last year, um, October, I think. It's one of the top and uh, most read papers in this journal at this moment, which means it's a very hot topic. This particular issue, uh, people know about this. And uh, the right hand side is an uh, iNews article about AI and the potential issues of uh, disadvantaging um, women and ethnic minorities. So if you are interested in that, you probably can can read that news article, which is easier to read compared to research articles. So let's start with um, fairness. Fairness, to be honest, is, is kind of a tricky notion. Um, just like, you know, ChatGPT is quite uh, quite uh, popular in recent days. But if you ask people, what do we mean by intelligence or AI intelligence uh, in, that, in that sense, Different people have different definitions. So make it difficult to discuss. Similarly, the situation applies to fairness. When you talk to people about what do you mean by fair? And uh, fairness is uh, as this uh, nice paper um, written by people from UC Berkeley, as very long, about 36 pages about um, fairness. So the concept of fairness is vast and ambiguous. Um, it really depends on the context talking to, and it really depends on who uh, you are going to serve especially developed as software uh, to help facilitate decision-making. So this not needs to be contextualized and also needs to be discussed with a domain expert in particular scenarios. So they set out a good uh, concept framework, how to uh, break down definition of fairness for your particular case study. Um, so I'm going to skip, skip that. I just to, uh, for this slide, just to mention that fairness is a tricky concept. So that's one of the reasons uh, fairness hasn't been evaluated, particularly, particularly in AI medicine scenarios so far. And going a bit more specific to uh, fairness or AI in AI-related fairness algorithm um, by a related bias in healthcare. This is a paper from um, Harvard University. It basically concludes that there's no broadly recognized um, 
quantitative summary uh, matrix for fairness. So most of these studies, um, they, they talked about are uh, uh, normally kind of correlative and uh, subject to in, in implicit bias of validators based on you know the scenarios or the use cases. So uh, which means that it's a bit, um, there's no consensus so far basically about how should we um, evaluate um, fairness in AI and decision making in healthcare. So the fact or the technical um, supports behind this, actually, we just have too many um, frameworks out there. So why I say too many? So I'm trying to say these uh, mathematical grounds, uh, technical grounds, uh, status grounds of fairness, definition, different scenarios, different metrics, actually, is well studied. We have many uh, metrics out there, many notions out there about fairness uh, related to data and related to um, software. So this is a survey paper published um, about five years ago. They just surveyed all these uh, top venues of AI uh, research, including uh, all these uh, top conferences and journals as well. And, and this table one listed in their paper basically summarizes about 20, around 20 fairness definitions and metrics people uh, usually use. You can see the citations, some of them actually used uh, quite a lot, cited at least cited quite a lot by different studies. But the problem is we have this reality um, in AI medicine. Um, these metrics hasn't, you know, haven't been widely adopted. So the question is why? Um, so, so our own thoughts, I think, is threefold, trying to figure out why uh, this is difficult uh, to adopt existing um, frameworks in AI in medicine. The first one could be, uh, it's confused. We have so many uh, to choose from. Which one fits my scenario the best? So it really depends on the context, but people sometimes just don't know which, which one is the best to, uh, to fit for purpose for my clinical decision-making criteria. For example, if you have, uh, let's say, you're going to screening for people with suicidal ideology, uh, that's a decision-making uh, criteria, which fairness should I use compared to another scenario like, you know, uh, in the COVID pandemic, and uh, we have limited ICU beds, uh, we have so many people waiting for using one ICU bed to save their lives, which one should we as uh, allocate as you bet too, the two different scenarios quite uh, you know substan substantially different um, decision making um, situations, and definitely you have different um, you you might consider different things. And out of the twenty, there's a twenty metrics. Which one should I use? It's confused, right? It's not um, you know even for accuracy. I think people sometimes struggle with what's the high precision high recall is better for my scenario. Look at the 20 uh, metrics for fairness. I'm sure people get confused all the time. So one of the challenges just behind this. The other one is, uh, you know, the same case can be considered fair according to some definitions, but unfair if you're using another definition, right? So that's that's another level of, uh, you know, you, you, you don't know, <laughs> you know, if, when you're using different scenarios, different metrics, you have different uh, conclusions about your model in terms of fairness or inequity. So that'd be an issue uh, behind that. And some of these metrics, to be honest, some for, um, you know, for you people using AI or apply AI in clinical decision making could be too complex or sometimes could be too generic to make it work in their, in their situation. So this will be, uh, you know, all these different scenarios, I think it's about confusion on which one to choose from all these available metrics or frameworks out there. Uh, the second uh, potential uh, difficulty um, resides on um, many of these frameworks out there. They rely on the why, for example, um, I will show this later, uh, especially for those you uh, evaluate algorithm and bad bias. They rely on the why, right, which is the tag variable. But in healthcare, we know many of these tag uh, variable we're using not necessarily fair. For example, uh, on the left-hand side, as you can see, this uh, uh, one figure from the science paper, one of the landscape uh, paper about AI fairness. So the AI model evaluated basically look at using the cost 
of the um, you, uh, of the patients to predict their health needs. This paper basically evaluates the um, whether they will cause any uh, bias in their decision making. So the x-axis basically the predictive score. The y-axis is a number of uh, comorbidities. Basically, is a kind of commonly used and metric to evaluate health status or deterioration status of a patient. As you can see, if we draw a vertical line from the x-axis um, upwards, you can see uh, the vertical line basically says that for all the patients, they have a similar predictive score from the IR model. But if you look at two groups of people, one black or the other white, the black people are always more deteriorated for the same prediction score, which means that the, the, the prediction algorithm is biased. They assign, um, let's say, for the same deterioration status, they assign higher scores to white population. So the reason behind this is because the algorithm uses the, the wrong or they say unfair target variable. But the unfair tackle variable, not particularly for that study, but it actually is quite pervasive in healthcare, uh, health data science. I just give you another example. For example, uh, for uh, diagnosis patients, we know the late diagnosis uh, happens all the time, right? Um, you know, and especially compare different uh, ethnicity groups. Uh, certain ethnic groups are more uh, likely to have late diagnosis compared with others. This is a study uh, published um, on JAMA Oncology looking at um, a breast cancer uh, diagnosis. And I just copied the conclusion of the, in, of the abstract here. I just highlight these numbers, 1.46 for non-Hispanic Black, 1.31 for getting late stage diagnosis compared to white um, women. As you can see, those uh, ethnicity minority groups, they are more likely to get late diagnosis. So which means if you're using this kind of, you're using this kind of uh, uh, target variable for your, let's say, structured database, look at the diagnosis ICD-10 codes for breast cancer, the code itself is already biased. So if you're using this one code to predict, even though you have very uh, fair comparison and fair accuracy between white and non-white population, the model is unfair because the target variable is unfair. So that's the second uh, issue of the current uh, existing fairness definition frameworks to be ad ad adopted directly in, uh, in healthcare. That's the second uh, difficulty. The, the third one and is uh, clinicians' op opinions on individuals' actual health needs are not easily integrable with fairness framework. And um, the reason the fairness, you need uh, clinicians' inputs because as we starting for the first example from UC Berkeley's definition, the fairness definition needs to be contextualized in particular scenarios. And I, I, I believe clinicians was one of the best people uh, you know, in the best position to decide who needs uh, certain resources in healthcare decision making. So for existing criteria, existing frameworks, they, it's very hard to say, clinician say for, a, let's say, um, liver surgery, I think this group of people are more likely to need this kind of requirement. They, their opinions is hard to be integrated because existing frameworks mainly look at the data for variables, target variables, features, not necessarily get inputs from clinicians. That'd be a third difficulty to apply existing frameworks in healthcare decision-making. So um, these are the hypotheses. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about next, uh, half of my, um, I look at how much time I have, probably about seven minutes. Um, okay. Um, so about one of the work we, we have done recently, as we published last year in the Ijekai conference about a, a new framework. Um, we call it a new framework, which is conceptually new. Actually, they have very good uh, relation with existing frameworks. I'll talk about that later. So the framework basically try to put uh, clinical decision making in an abstract uh, scenario. We call it a, re a resource allocation scenario. So basically, at the top, for any uh, AI um, enabled decision making scenario, we have resources. For example, we have hospital bed, which can be a hospitalization decision making. We have ICU bed for ICU uh, admission. 
we have surgery, we have medication, treatment, all that kind of stuff. We each one's treated a resource, okay? And the bottom, we have patients. So any AI decision-making is basically trying to uh, develop uh, the thing in the middle, we call it allocator, basically your AI model. Try giving the patients in your queue to allocate the limited resource to the to those patients, and uh, of course the idea to say how can we have a fair allocation um, for these patients. So this is based on this hypothesis that we have limited resource, which means that we cannot treat everyone, um, or we cannot have we do we, we don't have sufficient resources to meet everyone's health needs. Then we have to really to prioritize which one to allocate the resource to. That's the challenge there. And that's where we should have a fair allocation. Um, so the fairness in this kind of scenario is that the same level of health needs. So I'm going to expand now, what do I mean by health needs? The same level of health needs gets this equal access to resources. That's the basically abstracting um, scenario. So when I say health needs, let's look at a particular example. They say, we are going to have a, a kidney surgery. So one of the kidney, uh, one of the um, biomarkers to assess the patient kidney is called uh, creatinine, as you can see on the right hand side. Um, so different, you know, female male have different ranges of uh, normal readings of creatinine. So creatinine in this this particular scenario is uh, we call the objective assessment of patients' health needs for kidney surgery. Of course, it's not just not only one. And the clinicians can have opinions to say, we have to combine creatinine with age, with many other kind of uh, biomarkers as well. So in fact, um, from this paper, we, we know there are so many biomarkers out there, 25,000 diagnosed biomarkers, which we can use. And out of these 25,000, uh, 102 prognostic biomarkers, which assess the status of the patients in different aspects of the body system. And so which means that this 102 can be used as our so-called objective, we hope objective measurements to assess the health needs. So for any decision-making criteria, the clinician we have to say to say, we have to combine uh, biomarkers number one, two, three, five together to assess the health needs for this particular patient, for example, whether we should have a kidney surgery for these particular patients or not. So this is the, uh, the um, health needs, how the health needs are assessed. Now let's put things together. So we have a locator, which the locate uh, resources to uh, the patients. So the locator basically is the, is the AI model. So essentially the AI model gives you allocation index, basically from zero to one to say the probability the patient needs the, the resource. And the Y-axis we have deterioration index, basically is the, health needs um, objective assessment based on biomarks or based on some other measurements, the clinician might think is um, objective measurements of the health needs. Then for different groups of patients, let's say group patient one and two, group patient uh, one, um, basically we have these uh, brown um, you know, crosses and group, a group, patient group two, we have these kind of blue crosses. Then you have these, um, curves to uh, represent these patients. Then you basically can have these two curves and then you get the differences between these curves. And the difference between curves basically that difference in terms of the area under these two curves. So the area on these two curves basically quantifies the inequality between your AI model uh, to allocate resources to these uh, patient groups. Uh, because just like the uh, science paper example I showed you, if we draw a vertical line here, which your model gives the same prediction in terms of they need this resource, but actually look at the actual health needs, there's a difference. In this case, patient group one, uh, you know, uh, uh, disadvantaged by your allocation uh, allocator, which is your AI model. So basically that's the idea. Um, how much time I have, um, Vicky? Maybe a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Minutes. Okay. So uh, then I try, let, let me just maybe focus on this slide. Um, so this is a, 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 this is a framework people as from a recent summary in 2012, 
about uh, the fairness um, notions out there. And uh, the last two columns, basically, our analysis in terms of how are their applicability in clinical decision making. The first one, two ones, not directly applicable because it's hard to say we have to, different demographic patients groups needs to have similar, let's say, um, you know, surgery or the same type of disease status because it's, it's you know, healthcare is not working that way, basically. It needs to be adapted more specifically. For this, and the, the second box here with the area of parity, basically they're using why. As I mentioned uh, in one of the slides, the why in healthcare, not necessarily fair. So that's the issue, but actually our framework can apply these kind of um, metrics when we choose these uh, corresponding uh, predictions as the deterioration index, which means the DAAUC framework actually can be used to evaluate these three different uh, metrics. Of course, you have to make sure that why is fair in that scenario before you actually can apply, apply this. For other ones, um, um, focus on this one, I think it's more relevant to individual uh, fairness, is more relevant to the AUC, but individual fairness really uh, you relies on your definition of similarities between patients, uh, because you, you the assumption is that similar patients should have similar access to resources. So in our scenario, basically we have a deteriorating index basically used to quantify the similarity based on health needs. So it's a more kind of crystallized, uh, crystallized of individual fairness in the healthcare decision making. For causality based fairness, actually is kind of independent to our framework, which means that we actually can value that. Given the time, I don't think I have time to discuss uh, the result section, but I will give the link, which we um, do have details about uh, the applications of the AUC in two large data sets in the ICU in the public domain. So I'm just jump to the final uh, slide. So basically, what I'm trying uh, just to summarize, um, there are so many fairness definitions out there, metrics out there, and AI data induced inequality um, hasn't been widely assessed in AI medicine community, at least at this moment. So DAAUC is one way we try to link to existing framework by making it much easier and in a easy to selection uh, format for clinicians, for users applying AI in healthcare. We hope that can be a step forward to make things easier for people to use. And the final slide, just to say, you know, put the link already in the chat. We have uh, Alan Turing Institute Group on Health Equity. Uh, feel free to join. You haven't joined so far. And basically, um, you know, we already have a big uh, community. So we have a kind of monthly uh, events. It'd be good if you're in this area to join the community. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hong Hang. That was great. Um, yeah, if we get any extra time in the Q&A session, do feel free to touch on those points you missed. Um, I will now hand over to Fanny and Joshua. I don't know if one of you wants to try sharing your screen. Let's see. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Oh, uh, what about now? Is it working now? Yes, perfect. Oh, yeah, sorry, it kicked me out for a second there. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you so much, and sorry for putting my colleague on the spot. Sorry, Josh. Good morning and good afternoon for some. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss our AI with Roche Open Science initiatives and our contributions to health equity. My name is Fanny C and I lead AI and Immersion Tech Collaborations. And I'm also here with my colleague, Josh, that I totally put on the spot and I apologies, um, apologize for that. He is an AI and digital healthcare partner who leads our open science initiatives. Next slide, please. Before we start diving into our open science initiatives, I wanted to provide a bit of context. Why is our organization so focused on healthcare? As we know, through being patients or caregivers of our loved ones, the healthcare environment has unaddressed and more importantly, urgent needs. Still two thirds of diseases in the world are not treated adequately nor prevented. 70% of all clinical decision-making is influenced by in vitro diagnostics, despite accounting for only 2% of healthcare spend. At least half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services, according to a report from the World Bank and the WHO, and only 96% 
oh, sorry, 96% of patients are not in clinical trials, which means only 4% have access to innovative medicines. And that means we're missing a wealth of real world data that could help us better understand diseases. This also means there are large populations that are underserved. Over the 125 years of its existence, Roche has made significant contributions to healthcare through innovative scientific discovery and access initiatives to address these above challenges so people can get the care they need when they need it. Next slide, please. The Roche Group is a pioneer in pharmaceuticals and diagnostic fo diagnostics focused on advancing science to improve people's lives. In 1896, Fritz Hoffman LaRoche, a pioneering entrepreneur and the founder of Roche, was among the first to recognize that industrial manufacture of medicines would be a major advance in the fight against population level diseases. It is a company built on family values where patient impact is the priority in all our business planning and all our business meetings, as well as all of our scientific efforts. Roche has over 100,000 employees with over 100 affiliates across the globe to partner, to partner with local health systems and mobilize these innovations in science through therapeutics, diagnostics, and digital solutions. We are also one of the largest biotech investors in the world with a focus on oncology, immunology, infectious diseases, ophthalmology, and neurology. We have over 32 medicines on the WHO's essential medicine list. We invest early, we invest big, and for the long-term in pioneering science. Why am I giving you this commercial? <laughs> I'm giving you this commercial, sorry, next slide, please, because I wanted to provide you with an understanding of where our value system lays. We are passionate about people and we are passionate about science. At AI with Roche, we believe AI has a scientific, has a significant role to play in achieving exponential impact for patients by helping to address the challenges outlined at the beginning of the presentation. But we know we can't do this alone. Healthcare is a team sport. It takes a village to develop, implement, a scale, and scale a meaningful innovation into a healthcare system. The AI with Roche operational model that we will be describing was not the result of a perfect roadmap. The model we discovered that led to the rapid de development and deployment of science for health benefit arose out of the global pandemic. I remember it was April, 2020, and we were, we were sitting on the phone with my friends and we were saying, is this, is this real life? Is this what it's become? I feel like I'm sitting on a Netflix show. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna stop this? And after weeks and weeks, people were no longer their titles, their organizations or their remits, but they were just people coming together to try and solve a global problem. People would say, hey, I have five data scientists, maybe that'll help. Oh, I have three clinicians. Oh, I have infrastructure. And I have people who understand how to analyze the data. Within a few weeks, we assembled innovators from across the private and academic sector, which included the collaborators from the Pan-Canadian AI Institutes, the Vector Institute, Mila and Amy, which are led by Jeffrey Hinton, Yoshua Bengio, and Richard Sutton, respectively. We also made available over 300 open data sets on the Kaggle platform, which included population and individual level data with the intention of providing capacity management insights to the world. This wasn't about creating the next vaccine. This was about being able to develop and deploy insights rapidly. So hospitals knew how many ICU beds they could have, they needed any, at any one day or how many ventilators they would need. Within eight weeks, the community developed over hundred solutions in the form of AI algorithms, advanced analytics, reports, and dashboards. These solutions were made accessible to all for, who, for those who may not have had the resources to develop them on their own through, their Kaggle, through the Kaggle platform, through open forums and roundtables. These insights were mobilized to governments and health institutions and pandemic task forces all over the world through our Roche Global Affiliates and was used to inform social distancing practices during Ramadan in Pakistan, 
reopening strategies in Algeria, and testing strategies in Europe. Next slide. We thought, why wait for a pandemic to build these coalitions of the willing when there's so much urgency in the healthcare system? Why not create these mission and mandate driven groups for more therapeutic areas with urgent needs? The intentions of these coalitions is to democratize research globally and to contribute to health equity by enabling open access to data, expertise and tools from around the world. So I will stop there and I will pass it on to my colleague to dive a little bit deeper into some of the initiatives that we've been working on. Josh. Uh, thanks, Benny. Um, so I'll just start off a little bit here about an introduction to, to open science. So as you've probably seen through the COVID example that Benny shared and overall through our journey as we were building the AI with Roche ecosystem, it became increasingly clear to us the, the positive impact that these types of open ecosystems and open collaborations can have on society, particularly as AI and ML expertise continues to evolve. So within our AI with Roche projects, we've really aimed to embrace open science principles as part of our collaborations. So this includes aspects like fostering access to open data, uh, fostering an open community and open engagement and ensuring that uh, insights and ideas for solutions are made transparent and, and uh, made available in open environment and really using open science as an approach to go kind of beyond what a single group is able to do and use it as one approach to improve health equity as well too. Uh, it's clear the pandemic had really increase the awareness and heighten the importance around open science. Uh, you might've seen earlier this year, uh, the White House, as well as a number of federal agencies, universities and organizations had declared 2023 to be a year of open science. Uh, UNESCO also continues to develop and evolve their open science uh, toolkit, which is made publicly available. Uh, so the really the question for us in, in healthcare is how and, and why should we be contributing to open and, and science and the importance of open science to, to healthcare and, and for me in addition to the pandemic there is this article that had come out uh, late last year that really drove the point home in terms of why we should be supporting open science uh, within healthcare and it was actually an article that had come out from uh, the public library of science during the open access week when they're speaking on climate justice. And I, I pulled a, an excerpt from the article at the bottom left there. And it states, uh, for climate research, the immediacy reach a demonstrable rigor that open science offers is particularly vital. Uh, in climate research, every moment counts and, and all research matters. And as you can imagine, in a similar manner, this uh, relates to healthcare as well too, where um, every moment counts for, for all patients globally and all research matters. So how can we in healthcare help foster uh, open science, contribute to this open science movement and move towards faster disease understanding, treatment development, um, and provide access to, to different data and tools, and also use open science as an approach, as one way to improve health equity in the sense of allocating research resources towards research areas that could benefit from additional research efforts. So we'll share a little bit more about some of our collaborations that we've been involved in and how we've aimed to use open science as an approach to progress towards improving health equity. So the first uh, collaboration I'll speak to is one that we had within amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, which is a progressive nervous system disease. Uh, so for this particular project here, we had partnered with two groups out of the US, uh, one called Answer ALS, and the second group is called Everything ALS. Answer ALS is a, a global project that's aimed at creating a unified strategy to, to stop ALS. And through uh, the work of Answer ALS and their collaborators, they've actually been able to collect and curate a fairly uh, unique and robust uh, data set when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, this data set includes uh, clinical, genomic, and transgenomic data on a number of ALS uh, patients. Uh, the second organization that we worked with on this project here is Everything ALS, which is a, a nonprofit patient-focused organization that's aimed at bringing uh, different technological innovations and data science to support patients with ALS. Uh, Everything ALS was co-founded by an amazing individual. Her name is Indu Navar after she had lost her, her late husband to ALS. And Indu is really the, the main driver and inspiration for some of the work we're about to, to, to share. 
um, Indu was the one who had actually saw some of our open collaboration work that we did in COVID and wanted to see if we could take a similar open collaborative and open science approach uh, within ALS. Uh, so working closely with Answer ALS and everything ALS, we brought forth an open research uh, challenge, again, through the Kaggle platform to their AI and data science community to work towards uh, finding insights to key uh, research questions within ALS. So the the AI data science community was tasked with finding insights that could help shed some light in terms of the onset and progression of ALS. And I think through this open challenge, we were able to uh, generate some meaningful and active community discussion around ALS. There's participants from, from all over the globe and from both public and private sectors. And there were three uh, winning teams we had as part of this challenge, the first one being a academic collaboration between uh, UC Irvine and the Technical University of Munich. Uh, there is a startup, um, an AI and digital health startup called Bowhead Health. Uh, and also uh, one of the winning individuals is Ryan Cloak, who participated as an individual uh, data scientist. And really the solutions from this challenge, which are made publicly uh, available, confirm some key biological pathways in ALS and identify new genes of interest. And a key part of these open ecosystems we're hoping to create is ensuring that we communicate these solutions and ideas and insights back to various communities as well too, including patient communities, but also those that are able to uh, further develop or scale some of these solutions and foster further collaborations um, from an open environment. Uh, so as part of the challenge, we had a session where we invited patient communities, research communities, and venture communities to have a deeper dive with the winning teams on some of their solutions. And while the initial challenge has ended, this is the really the type of ecosystem that we're trying to uh, create where each organization brings a critical piece to the scientific research life cycle, whether it's data synthesis and governance, infrastructure, and solution and communication, there's still a lot for us to learn from this model. I think there's similar learnings that uh, Hung Hat had brought on during his presentation around like ensuring that these AI algorithms that are created in an open environment don't exacerbate uh, existing biases within um, the research environment. But we are looking to build upon this model and continue to work with Answer ALS and everything ALS to hopefully launch a, a second challenge uh, this year as well. And I'll just quickly share two more ongoing collaborations uh, that we have. The first one is with an organization called RareX. And RareX is a nonprofit patient advocacy group, and they're aimed at um, looking to eliminate barriers uh, that would allow patients to actively engage, collect, and responsibly share their data with the research environment with the aim of expanding the diversity, inclusion, and equity when it comes to research to accelerate progress within rare diseases. Uh, so we're working with RareX to launch a open science data challenge next month, which will be aimed at addressing key research questions in rare pediatric and neurodevelopmental diseases, uh, which is an area that uh, appears to uh, that they can benefit from additional research efforts. Uh, so in this case here, we'll be working with the, the Dream Challenge through the nonprofit CHBO networks to launch the challenge. And through the challenge, where X is hoping to make uh, tentative data sets available, which includes patient reported symptoms, uh, validated patient reported outcomes, and genetic test reports publicly available to the community to work on as part of this challenge. And we're hoping insights from the challenge will help shorten the diagnostic odyssey, uh, identify previously unrecognized symptoms, and advance uh, research in this area um, of need. And the last collaboration I'll touch on is one that we have with Seneca College, uh, which is an applied arts and technology institution here in Ontario, Canada. Our collaboration here with Seneca is a little bit more focused on open solution development versus scientific research, but still carries the same principles of wanting to foster that open community and open collaboration. Uh, so over the last three years, we've sponsored a hackathon at Seneca College where uh, students, including those that are, are in computer science um, and supporting them through um, uh, developing solutions uh, in a defined set of period of time to pertinent societal challenges. Previous themes for this hackathon have included COVID-19, digital health, and sustainability. And some of our contributions to this hackathon has been to help raise awareness and engagement with open data sets among 
uh, the student communities. So, and, and this uh, year, we have a fairly exciting uh, challenge as part of the hackathon we'll be supporting. We'll be working with a, a First Nations group uh, here in Ontario, Canada, called the self Skin First Nations. And we'll be working with them along with the student groups uh, to come up with solutions related to diabetes healthcare within First Nations uh, groups. Uh, so in this case here, really looking to use uh, open collaboration and open science to uh, help uh, direct uh, resources towards uh, uh, more underserved communities. Uh, so hopefully through those three examples, it's given a bit of an overview of those open ecosystems where we're trying to foster and how in healthcare we can contribute to um, and improve health equity. There's still much for us to, to learn uh, within this area, but hopefully it sparked some interest in terms of how we can collectively uh, contribute to open science within the healthcare realm. Uh, but maybe with that, I'll pass it over to back to Fanny to, to close up the, the presentation. So our final slide is really a call to action to collaborate to help to build an equitable future in healthcare. As Josh mentioned, we have a number of open science challenges that we're actively involved in, as well as initiating in the next couple of months in the area of rare condition ALS and First Nations. Um, we also are open to working on open science approaches, what types of platforms we could explore together, or even the actual approach or administration of these types of open science um, forums. Uh, we also are working to build communities of practice or communities of interest where we would bring a number of the academic institutions such as Amy, Mila, and Vector, as well as our own internal scientists together with hopefully the Turing Institute to work on some of these grand challenges. Um, you can reach us at AI with Roche and we look forward to interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manny and Josh. Um, if you just stop sharing the screen, great. Um, we have now got about seven minutes for a Q&A session, um, but all the speakers are in the Slack uh, if you have extra questions afterwards and um, we can pose extra ones there. Um, so I will uh, kick us off with the Slido, but if you do want to ask your um, a question live, um, then feel free to raise your virtual Zoom hand. Um, so Hong Hang, uh, the first question for you, um, how do we address intersectionality in the proposed framework that you, sh that you showed? Thanks, Ricky. Um, so intersectionality basically means uh, mix different things like race and gender to be compound factor related to, um, for example, unfair unfairness in terms of AI or data embedded in inequality. So um, put this in the context of uh, any fairness framework, I think it's more, it's kind of related, but also kind of uh, separated as well. In a way, it depends on how you have the strata of your population for comparing fair and unfair, right? So for example, you can say, I'm only look, only look at a gender that's a female versus a male, or I'm only look at a race, um, you know, black versus uh, white, or you can have, you know, black female versus others. So really depends on this. It really, uh, I think um, it's hard to have a framework which can address this properly. It's more, it needs to be break down to a case-based decision to say, you've got the you got your domain expert to say, like a clinician doing kidney surgery to say, we really need to look at the black females compared to, you know, white male or some other strata in that way. A proper definition of the strata really depends on the case. Um, that's that's my short answer, basically. Um, thank you. Um, and for Josh and Fanny, uh, where do you see your work had the greatest impact on Roche's drug development and portfolio? I think what you can see is the ability to engage a large population of scientists and doing that at a rapid pace helps us to prioritize our existing molecules internally within our pipeline. So in the ALS competition, we had identified new biomarkers and new drug targets that helped us to make better judgments on research moving forward uh, within our research and development groups. Yeah, and I could just quickly add to that. I think as part of our open science projects, um, I think uh, 
a, a large benefit of, of what we're trying to achieve is for the entire healthcare system. I think there's insights that we gather from these open science projects that we can all benefit from. I think there's uh, better understanding the disease or the underlying biology, I think is something that uh, should be open and that's something that all industries can, can benefit from. And then you kind of take those to uh, your research development and then you're able to um, compete on a, a drug. But I think the underlying principle that we try to abide to during our open science projects is creating those insights and uh, learnings that, that can be shared across uh, different industries. Great, thank you. Um, Hong Hai, I think this is a question for you. I think it came in earlier and I think maybe you would have addressed it if you'd done those extra slides, but kind of, um, yeah, how, yeah, sorry. With so many different metrics, will we be able to get a model which is totally fair or if we achieve fairness by one metric, kind of which other metrics will not be met? Yeah, it's, I, I believe it's, it's almost impossible to got uh, <laughs> totally fair for all the metrics because some of the metrics is competing with each other, basically. You're fair in one situation, not fair in another situation. Uh, for example, look at, uh, you know, precision-based uh, metrics, uh, look at the you know, false negative. That can be, uh, that can be you know, hard to get that. And come back to the point, I think it's mainly about um, the most important is if you put in the simple, uh, context like resource allocation. So how can we make sure we allocate resource to those who uh, have the health, the similar health needs with the similar access to resource? That's the abstract level of things. And how to achieve that basically needs to be defined by the, um, by the conditions, by the scenarios. Uh, again, that's why I think we really needed to have a mechanism to get domain expert input in terms of deterioration index definition. Because you know one situation I as mentioned in um, as you bet the location compared to some other screening process can be totally different. Yeah. Completely. And then maybe Fanny and Josh to put you on the spot, but to kind of link that to you guys, it sounds like you're working kind of like closely with clinicians. I don't know if you want to comment on that kind of resource allocation point at all. We did have some experience with resource allocation during the pandemic. I think it, it becomes tough because, you know, there are a lot of issues such as fairness that haven't actually been worked out at large scale. And so um, we have that experience. We do deal with a lot of clinicians, and I think we're working very closely with clinicians to try and figure out the precision that is needed for different decisions, right? Like the tool, if a tool is going to be used at an individual level, you need a different level of precision. If a tool is going to be used at a population level, different level of decision, yeah. Yeah, and I could quickly add to that as well too. I think that was one of our key learnings when we were running these open challenges and how we can uh, provide some guidance, our guardrails in terms of how these uh, algorithms are created in open space and provide some of that guidance in terms of uh, how can ensure that uh, the algorithms are uh, free of bias or developed uh, in a way that would be um, relate to how clinicians use them in real world practice. So from these upcoming challenges, we are looking to see how we can more uh, provide those guardrails to the communities uh, as part of the challenge as well to help them through their solution development. Yeah, thank you so much both. I think it was useful with your talks as well to kind of see that granular level and the kind of broader level as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, we have got a few extra questions in the slides.